Hello, and welcome to the podcast. Today, oh god, let me try this again. Blech. Hello, and welcome to the, oh my god, it's welcome to the Bookcast Club. <laughs> Hello, and welcome to the Bookcast Club, a podcast for people who love books. And today, me and Sarah are going to be talking to you about the novel Pod by Laylene Paul, which was recently longlisted for this year's Women's Prize for Fiction. But before we do that, we're going to talk a little bit about what we've been reading currently. How are you doing, Sarah? Hello. Good, thank you. Um, we forgot to say where we're coming from. Or where we are. Oh, we did forget to say where we're coming yeah. from. <laughs> and I'm coming to, from uh, the fantastic city of Indianapolis. And Sarah, where are you coming from today? I'm coming to you from Lutruwita or Tasmania in Australia. Um, do you want to hear oh. something super Australian? I can see not one, but two spiders right right at this very moment. <laughs> Isn't that oh, <laughs> see, oh, I don't think I can do Australia. I, I noticed them before we started. I was like, I better tell Chris up at the top, just so he knows. Um, I actually saw a third one before I tried to get it out, out, but it ran away. And I thought, oh, well, it can stay. It can stay. <laughs> They're just sitting. That's it. That's a very Australian reaction. <laughs> My reaction would be very different. Much more hysterics involved, screaming yep. and calling of authorities totally. to come assist I'd, with the issue. Yeah, imagine I receive a photo of, from you of the spider, very blurry of a tiny spider. <laughs> a spider, and you're like, I have been assailed <laughs> by this creature. I remember once actually. Um, a couple of years ago with a friend of mine who's German, we were reading um, The Dry by Jen Harper, which is an Australian detective mm -hmm. novel, right? We were discussing the book afterwards and she was like, oh, that shower scene was absolutely horrific. It stayed in my mind. And I was like, shower scene? <laughs> and I didn't even notice. <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny. Hadn't even clocked the spider in the shower, you know. Well, have you been reading anything good lately? Um, I just started last night a nonfiction book. This is very esoteric. Um, it's called The Biggest Estate on Earth. How Ab Aborigines Made Australia by Bill Gamage, which is something that's been on my TBR for absolutely ever. It's an enormous nonfiction, one of those like um, bigger than A5, those kind of like almost coffee table size, textbook size, that's what I'm thinking. <laughs> Aren't I cool? And it's got in a, a lot, you know, it's got a lot of photos and diagrams and stuff. And th it's about how Australia was when Europeans first came and how it looked, and specifically how the indigenous people would look after the land. Because this is a whole thing in Australia. There's like bushfires every year. The land has basically gone to shit. There's always a lot of arguments about how we can prevent bushfires. Bushfires are kind of part of the ecosystem, but we've kind of lost track of... We've completely... Well, white people never knew in the first place, but we've completely lost track of how to actually take care of this, how to actually incorporate um, bushfires into our sort of ecology i guess how to incorporate this because we just sort of have a very like european way of taking care of land um and what happened mm -hmm. when europeans originally came is that they basically treated the land like you do in the uk and like you do in europe where you can sort of clear it uh completely make these big fields and then start to grow crops and that doesn't work in australia at all because our um, the ecosystem is completely different so they kind of destroyed well they did destroy australia in a big way uh, and they thought that the way that the indigenous people were doing it was all wrong and it was very um you know primitive and whatever but what they're actually doing is something that's very sensitive to the climate and very sensitive to the actual ecosystem and so in this book he's kind of going through what they were actually what evidence we have for what they're actually doing and wh what it actually looked like and how it actually differs from uh, sort of western i guess ground keeping which i know is a very specific topic i am really interested in gardening <laughs> but i'm really enjoying it uh so far i got it from the library that's very interesting that sounds really good is it quite um, as far as like the ease of reading for people who maybe aren't as familiar with the topic, is it fairly academic or is it fairly approachable? It's on the academic side um, in a good way. It's in that kind of just like fact, fact, fact. It's not, It's I, I don't find it dry, but mm -hmm. I think I'm a very poor judge of what's an academic style and what isn't because I am an academic, I suppose. <laughs> so yeah, <laughs> sometimes I read reviews of people like, this was very dry. And I'm like, oh, is it? <laughs> it's because my baseline is so bad for nonfiction. But yeah, it kind of reminds me of... Um, that book that was going around braiding sweetgrass, which I started, but I didn't like this book actually. Braiding sweetgrass, I found it too, almost too memoiry for what it was, and it's quite got quite a mm. sweet writing mm -hmm. style. And I I didn't I it was a bit um, what's the word I'm looking for? 
what's that word that you always use? Sentimental. It was a bit sentimental. Mm, yeah. And I didn't really like it. So this is a similar kind of idea, but tackled in a very, very different way. I'm enjoying it a lot more. Interesting. Well, that sounds quite good. Um, I have to brag a little bit about my reading because I have been blasting through these women's prize books. So I have, I think I've made it through six now. Bloody hell. Um, but the one I know, well, two of them I DNF'd. So like, that counts. Um, you've, you've interacted, you've engaged, yeah. you've got an opinion. Yes. Yeah. So the two I DNF'd is I DNF Stoneblind by Natalie Haynes. Um, and these are not like judgments on the books. It was just like, I could tell within the first 20 pages that this was not going to be for me. Chris, um, that sounds like a judgment uh-huh. on the book. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is not a judgment on the book but I simply couldn't finish it <laughs> yeah <laughs> and the other one I DNF'd was Glory by No Violet Bulawayo um, and that one I actually was a little disappointed that I DNF'd because I read like the, a whole like half of the book um, and I actually thought it was quite smart and interesting but like by the halfway point of the book I was just like I get it like it just felt like a book that could have been so much shorter given how distant it was with the characters and how like kind of fable-esque and comic and sarcastic it was kind of being. I was like to the point where I was like, all right, the point has been made and I just didn't feel compelled to finish. But the book that was has been the standout book for me for, that I have read so far um, is Wandering Souls by Cecile Penn which is a book about refugees from Vietnam going to the UK and it follows three siblings who were sent ahead of the rest of their family on a boat to Hong Kong and the rest of their family were supposed to arrive at the refugee camp in Hong Kong with them and then they were supposed to go on to the United States where they were going to meet up with an uncle of theirs. Unfortunately the three siblings arrive safely in Hong Kong but the rest of the family dies en route and their plans to make it to the US are overturned and they end up having having to settle in the UK. And the book follows the lives of these three siblings as they have to settle in the UK and build a life for themselves. And as um, they have to grapple with the fact that the people who had this plan for them are gone and now they have to do something about it. And it also follows the voice of uh, one of the young siblings who died in transit and has not been properly laid to rest and so his soul is wandering so the title wandering souls is really interesting because it kind of has all these different multiple layers you know it has the wandering souls who are wandering because they have been laid to rest they died in transit their bodies haven't been um, laid in their home and it also has these siblings who are now kind of wandering adrift unsure of what to do with their lives and never feeling like they truly belong in england and i thought it was amazing and the way i connected with and felt so compelled by these characters and so emotionally devastated devastated for what was happening to them and a book which is so short was incredible I felt the kind of way that I normally feel from a book that's like 500 600 pages where I've spent like weeks and weeks with these characters Um, and instead it was just two three brief sittings because the book is just so compulsive and short and I just thought not a word of it was out of place Um, and I'm just really excited to see what she does next oh this is exciting I've actually got this I believe this is waiting for me at the library because I put on hold all the mm. ones that the library had, basically, for the Women's Prize long list. And I think, yeah, it is. It's waiting for me. I'm got, actually going to go pick it up today. Having a little trip to the library. Oh, afterwards. absolutely. So, it's, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. It's very good. Yeah, it sounds really interesting to me. I would definitely say that, like, if you have a day coming up where you know you're not going to have a whole lot that you need to do and stuff like that, it's a good book to save for that day. Oh, um, yeah. Because I think that it really benefits from kind of reading it in as few of sittings as possible. And you can, because it is so short. Like, the book... It's like just a little, my edition was just a little over 200 pages and it had massive font. So like it just was, I was almost surprised that it was eligible for the women's prize. Mm. It was so short. Probably just. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. And the other book that was a real standout for me and one that I was not expecting to like as much as I did was Homesick by Jennifer Croft, which is kind of an interesting one to talk about because the version of the book I read is not actually the version that has been long listed for the women's prize. So when it was released here in the United States, it was released Mm. as a memoir and it has pictures throughout the book. And also I believe that the second half of the book is different in the United Kingdom. So I don't know how exactly this reads for British audiences. Well, yes. um, Sorry to interrupt. It, it gets turned into a fiction book. Like it's really weird. This is a very interesting book, right? Because Obviously, a non-fiction is not eligible for the Women's Prize, 
So a yep. later edition has been yeah, turned into a fiction memoir, sort of a bit of auto-fiction, which is very interesting. Yep. And I, to be honest, I'm surprised it's eligible. As well. well, the conceit of it here in the United States is also a little bit auto-fiction-y because even though it's a memoir, it's telling the author's story through the perspective of two sisters, neither of whom are named after the author. So it's telling the story through the perspective, and I don't have the book anymore, so I, I'm pretty sure the sisters' names are Sarah and Zoe. And Zoe gets very sick. She has, like, a brain tumor or something wrong with her. She keeps having these seizures. And Sarah, I'm pretty sure I remember these names correctly, so if I'm wrong, do forgive. Oh, it's Amy. Thank you. She is kind of a child prodigy when it comes to translation and language. And she's able to go on to college in the United States when she's only 15 years old. Because technically in America, you don't have to have a high school degree to go to university. It's extremely rare that people are admitted without high school degrees, but it does happen. And she was one of those rare instances. And so she, at the age of only 15 years old, she leaves behind her younger sister who's struggling with these health issues and she goes and lives in university. And on top of like the health issues her sister is facing, the mom in this story is a little overbearing and she's kind of obsessed with things that like you really shouldn't tell children that make the world sound like it's scary and she's always kind of telling them these kind of inappropriate things not like sexually inappropriate but like violent almost about the world around them and so it's it's a really interesting look at like loss of innocence too early and it's also about language and how language is both limited in its ability to convey human experience and also limitless <laughs> in its ability to convey human experience and how the beauty of language kind of lies in that border region between what it can express and what it can't express. And there's all these really, if you get the American edition, all these really interesting and beautiful photographs. Um, and it's told in this very fragmented avant-garde style. And I really enjoyed it. Um, the first half of it, I wasn't totally convinced that I was going to love it. I thought maybe it would be a bit too experimental for me. But as I went on, it really sunk its claws into me. And I just thought it was really different and really interesting and quite a unique piece of art that I'm really glad got longlisted. Yeah, I'm really interested in this one. Um, so the character, so Amy, the character, is is her, what you think? Is Jennifer Croft? Yeah, she is a translator. Jennifer Croft, yeah, yeah, and she did go to that. That was Jennifer Croft's story. Okay. She did go to college when she was only fifteen years old, and she you know became this Booker Prize winning translator. Yes, yeah, so, yeah. I'm so interested in this, especially for who she is. Like, so for anyone who doesn't know, she is the translator for Olga um, Tokarczuk. I believe is how you pronounce the surname. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Polish writer who. I can't even remember what she's done. She's won the Booker? No, she hasn't won the Booker. What did she win? She she won the International Booker. The international she won Booker, the right. International Booker, I think. Yeah. She either won it for Drive Your Plow, Bone, Plow Drive Your Plow Over the Bones of the Dead, or the Book of Jacob. I can't remember which, but she won it for one of them. Okay, yeah. So I'm, re- I'm just really interested in, in Jennifer Croft as a, as a person. I think it's pretty interesting. And yeah. also, yeah, it's such a weird little book. Like, the whole way that this book, like, like the, maybe there isn't as much change as... as I think there might have been. Perhaps it's more just a publisher thing where they're sort of selling it in different mm-hmm. ways. Basically the same thing. Yeah, because it could have been published as a novel here. It could have just been published as like an autofiction novel yeah, kind of the same way that I think it's Rachel Cusk's books are. Yeah. Or like Edward Louis. You know, his books are extremely autobiographical, but they're novels. Yeah, interesting. I'm looking forward to that one. Um, and then the Stella shortlist has come out recently, so I'm currently making my way through that oh, as well. Yeah, I think we're going to do an episode. Not, not me and you, but me and someone else <laughs> gonna... yeah, somebody who can get their hands on australian books <laughs> yeah someone someone i like more no i'm just joking um <laughs> yeah we're gonna do a short stella shortlist episode i think in i'm gonna say may Okay, we want to take a quick break to let you know about the ways that you can support the podcast. A really effective and free way of showing your support is by rating and reviewing us on Spotify or on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to your podcasts. You can share our posts on social media. We are at Podcast Club on both Instagram and Twitter. We can also write a monthly newsletter that you can sign up to on our website, which is listed in the show notes. If you would like to support the podcast financially, we also have a Patreon account. You can sign up for as little as $2 a month. We offer early access to the podcast, monthly bonus episodes, personalized book recommendations, and books in the post. 
And we also have a coffee where you can make one-off contributions if you would prefer. The link for all of that is in the show notes, as are all the books and other things that we discussed today. But however you choose to support us, we want you to know that we really appreciate it. And thank you so much for listening. All right. Shall we talk about Pod by Leileen Paul? Yeah, this is the book that I was the most motivated about on the long list by far because it sounded pretty weird. Oh, it was for me too until I actually started reading it. (laughs) Jesus Christ. (laughs) Okay. Spoiler alert for how I felt about this book. (laughs) I mean, you can tell by the way, just by your brain, like, shall we talk about... I can't do your voice. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Shall we talk about Pod? Okay. How, How to even summarize this? Do you have a good summary or should I try? I'll try. So it's about dolphins, basically. We're talk- we're- it's a story told from the perspective of dolphins in the ocean, and basically you've got one main character dolphin, <laughs> MC Dolphin. Um, I don't know how to pronounce her name. Ea? It's, it's literally E-A. Ea, yeah. Ea. Yeah, that's okay. how I would say. Unless it's supposed to be like funny, and you have dolphins speak like ee 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 Maybe it's supposed to be oh. like ee. I was just thinking of Ea games. <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> So she's the she's the main the main dolf in this in this story, um, and she's basically a bit of an outsider in her own pod. Uh, she has she the rest of the pod of, the, of dolphins can hear the ocean and she can't. So she's sort of a little bit different, a little bit of an outsider. Um, and then I guess we're not going to say in, in too much detail what actually happens, but basically she ends up leaving the pod and joining another pod essentially. Um, and then a bunch of stuff happens to her. And it's about, so it's mostly about her main pod that are called Long Guys, I think. Long Guys is the name of their pod. And then there's all these other creatures that you hear from, like you hear from the perspective of a whale, you hear it from like stingrays there are as well, or manta rays, whatever they are. Um, and we're look, just sort of having a look at the uh, the community and the uh, the politics of ocean life, basically, is this story. Yeah. Do you even get like the perspective of like a parasite that has latched itself onto Ea? Yeah. Um, All manner kind of, of creatures. Talks to her and is quite mocking. Oh my god. Okay. So I find the concept of this book so intriguing. And when I first started reading it, I actually really enjoyed it. Um, and it motivated me to go on YouTube and like watch this documentary on dolphins. And I actually find, I think it's quite naive to think that humans are kind of the only creatures out there that have complex cultural and social relationships and we are very limited in our ability to understand other um, species cultures and rituals etc but we know that they exist we can observe certain parts of them so i watched this really fascinating beautiful documentary about these um, dolphins and i find the idea that those cultures exist and that we are so limited in our ability to understand them and our ability to conceptualize them or communicate them i find that fascinating and i think it adds to the richness and complexity and beauty of the world around us and i think it is so cool that art can strive and reach for this type of understanding and i think that this book took a gigantic shit on all of that beauty okay okay so (laughs) i hated it why why did you hate it i hated the writing i hated the fact that and every part of this book that could have been like interesting in the sense that it was presenting something to us that could only be understood whale-like right or Mm -hmm. dolphin-like or anything like that instead it 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 haphazardly slaps on this very humanized look at these animals which i get it like that's the only way you i don't know i find i find the execution so clumsy so pedestrian and so like so unbelievably repetitive and because so much of this book is about like the sensations that these dolphins are feeling and stuff like that you get these descriptions over and over and over and over again okay and just an incredible amount of dolphin rape like an un godly amount of dolphin rape to the point where i kept thinking to myself surely i have i have read the last dolphin rape scene <laughs> And I was wrong. I had not read. There was more dolphin yeah, rape. <laughs> and it's just so unbelievably, it, it got under my skin. I, I'm not going to lie to you. The last 20 pages, I was so annoyed that I still had to continue reading this book. That the last like 30, 40 pages skimmed so fast. I just, I could not. 
it was amazing to me that I could feel watching this documentary, actually seeing these dolphins, I could feel such like this emotional, spiritual connection just by looking at them and all that, right? Completely unable to bridge that connection to the reader. Okay, let's um I, I didn't hate it <laughs> i quite liked it actually i'm glad i got that out of my system it has been <laughs> yeah. bothering me you go yeah. ahead and, and say <laughs> <laughs> he's ready to leave let's pull that back let's go through let's go let's break it down all right <laughs> so i quite liked it so this is fun so let's discuss the writing shall let's go through your critiques one by one so the writing you didn't like um oh god i no. do agree that it is repetitive um at times and I found it because there's a lot of description about like moving through the water, a lot of reference yes, to the fact that they're swimming. Um, but also, <laughs> I kind of kept forgetting that I was reading about dolphins. So I, I guess this is my memory is so poor. So I would sort of be reading it and there would be something else about like a dolphin. Like, you know, they go up to the surface. I'm like, oh, that's right. They have dolphins. <laughs> so I kind of. Yeah, because she is completely unable to convince you that you're reading about dolphins. Yeah, I guess so. She she is completely unable to suspend that disbelief and present... Th- I kept thinking, if you just wanted to write about human societies and human patriarchal systems and human sexual assault, just write about humans, you know? Don't have this haphazard slapdash conceit that is just bonkers. <laughs> okay. Um, Sorry, I need to calm down. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> I hated it. I gave it one star, Good which Lord. is very rare for me I, to do. I know. I was waiting for because So Chris, for background information, Chris was texting me like four <laughs> days ago saying how much he hated the book. Um, and I was waiting for you to come because you've done this to me before. You've done the bait and switch yeah. to me before. I was waiting for you to come on and be like, so this is the best book I've read in 10 years, <laughs> which you've definitely done before. <laughs> <laughs> so when we started today I was like I wonder where he's going to have ended up <laughs> no. who's to know he's a man of extremes anyway I do agree that the translation to humans uh, sorry from humans to dolphins is a little bit clumsy however I've only read seen this so I've read quite a lot of books that are like from the perspective of animals and I've only really mm-hmm. seen this done well like once to be honest yeah. And I've, this is—it's a hard. It's very conceit. hard. The mo- the most recent book I read that did this kind of thing was Glory by um, No Violet Bulawayo, which is sort of a little bit different because it's a little bit like satirical. It's not quite the same. You're not—they're mm-hmm. not literally animals. Whereas in this book, well, they kind of are, but anyway, that's not the point. Yeah. Um, in this book, they literally are all animals, and she is, and I think it is very, very. I've never seen this done well in it where the whole book was animals so i think the best example i've got of this is a book called the octopus and i by erin hortel uh, which is an, a tasmanian novel actually and in the octopus and i it's told from the perspective of, of a human and the octopus has got chapters in it which are really weird really hard to follow i think the way that she personifies the octopus is incredible but it's it's so you couldn't read a whole novel like that right so when I think of examples where this has been exactly. done really well, I think to honestly, it would be almost unreadable from a whole to, for a whole novel. So I yes. kind of wonder to what extent I suppose it's actually. I mean, it must be possible. Everything is possible, but I I've never read a book. I don't think from animal perspective that was actually not that was good without um and also lost the human element. Do you know what I mean? Well, you know what it makes me think of. Weirdly, it makes me think of the Life Ship Traders trilogy by Robin Hobb, because that book is punctuated by um, excerpts which are told from the perspective of these sea creatures mm-hmm. called sea serpents. And you don't know like what exactly they are, but they have these incredibly strange cultures and interactions. And when you read these, they feel very otherworldly yeah. and kind of like impossible to really understand the first time you read it until you know, you know what I'm trying to say? Where And I feel like if you're going to write about dolphins, ostensibly, it should have that similar feel. Because humans and dolphins are not able... You know what I'm trying to say? The cultures, the setting, all that different stuff is so different. Whereas this book, I never felt it. I never once believed that I was reading about dolphins. Yeah, it's... um, But I agree with what you're saying. But then I wonder, like, I would not like to re- to read a whole book set from the, the perspective of those exactly. serpents. 
exactly. I completely agree. Which is why I'm saying I think the con the conceit was rubbish. <laughs> yeah. Should have been scrapped for the for the floor. <laughs> so you think she what should have done it? Not not about do- like what do you think she should have done? Only written about humans. Humans. <laughs> if she's <laughs> if she's so, it, it, I guess if they are so, I I didn't find that there was an aspect about dolphin culture, biology, environment, setting, anything that revealed the theme she was trying to work with. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm trying to say? Like, at no point was I was like, oh, that was really incisive and thoughtful because it was about dolphins and not humans. I was better able to understand this theme of patriarchy, sexual assault, mm-hmm. um, trauma, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Never once, you know what I'm trying to say? Like, that conversation <laughs> wasn't there. It felt like somebody who had gotten really obsessed with dolphins and the beauty and wonder about them and also realized that they needed to write a commercial literary fiction book about these very human themes. I was like, let me find a way to do this. Well, she... Well, funny you say that. I don't know if you read the story notes, but... I didn't. Okay, that's basically... What you're saying is basically accurate. She said... Um, she basically talks about how this was inspired by her going on a dolphin swim about ten years ago. Um, so she went on some, I'm just looking at the story notes at the back of my book. She says, a decade, a decade before this book was published, I went on my first excursion swimming with wild dolphins. And then she tells a story about how the pod was around them. Um, so that kind of started the whole thing, basically. And so the, from her perspective, the way that she seems to frame the book from these, these story notes, is she, she th- seems to think that it's purely about saving the natural world. Which... What? I was quite surprised to read at the end, to be honest. Um, yeah, you do not get that feeling. No, I, I, there, in some ways that is definitely true. There are because obviously there's so there's a dolphin in here who uh, lives his life in captivity, and then he is Google go, Google his name is here for some reason. I thought it was really odd move, but anyway. Yeah. So he, I really liked his story. Actually, that was really I thought that was really well done. His was the only good story in the whole book. Yeah, I found it definitely the most compelling. It was the most compelling, but yet again. The closest I got to believing that he was not human was that he read to me, like, the perspective of, like, a dog that had been abused. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he he was... So, that basically, what happens is this, this dolphin... So, there's just a number of dolphins who you hear from their perspective. And one of them is one who is born in captivity. He's conditioned in some kind of, like, sea world entertainment type place. Um and then something horrific happens to him, actually, and he ends up being um, freed. Well, he sort of escapes, basically. And then yeah. he ends up in the ocean, and he's trying to get back to where the humans were, except you can see as the reader that the humans have been extremely cruel to him, but he doesn't quite understand what has happened to him. Um, so it's very yeah. sad, actually. Um, that was definitely my favourite part he, of it. But... I think he was actually being trained as like a military weapon. Okay, yeah, I wasn't sure where... Because it sounded at the beginning like it was a trick, but then he obviously he learns to detonate stuff. Yes. And I couldn't quite understand exactly... Like, I don't... I couldn't quite understand exactly the link because it seemed like a very odd thing for them to be doing, but... Yeah, okay. Because he also talks about applause and stuff, I think. It's odd. Yeah. But I think... I'm pretty sure they were training him to be, like, some sort of, like, submarine military weapon where he would, like, go in and do stuff with bombs. Mm. Um, so, like, that was interesting to think about, like, how humans have militarized animals and stuff like that over the years and used them for wars and stuff. Mm. Um, but that section of the book, it's, it's not a big portion of the book at all. Like, it's, I don't know, total maybe 20, 30 pages of the whole book. And it's told in these very brief fragments of his story. So I just, yeah, I didn't, didn't love that. So yeah. how did you feel in terms of, like, character development like or like as much as you can with characters like like these yeah i thought it was so i thought the so i thought a lot of the peripheral characters um so the story is kind of the way that the story unfolds is basically that a lot of the things happen to the main character basically and i thought that the way that these things unfolded were pretty weak it was pretty it was pretty black and white. Mm-hmm. Like these things happened to her because some of the dolphins were very cruel to her, and they did these kind of. It was weird because I was thinking like, if it was a human story, I would have said like, "Oh, this is a caricature of a villain. Like it's ridiculous." Yes. But I don't know. I mean, it's an animal. <laughs> How complex is an animal? Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> so it was kind of a weird, um, a weird way to be thinking about. I was like, "Oh, this dolphin just seems to be quite ev- quite bad, uh, and not that complex." But then I was like, "Well, it isn't dolphin." <laughs> like. 
know yeah. how many layers of complexity yeah. does the dolphin have. I don't know. <laughs> um, so, and then the way that the main character developed was just basically a response. I mean, how else do you develop a character really? But she's just kind of responding to things that happened to her. Um, I thought it was good. I think I thought it was good. It's a little bit weird to be critiquing character development of a dolphin. <laughs> it does. Yeah. It does screw you up a bit. Um, well, like, there were some, like, I guess, like, dolphins I found mildly interesting. Like, I found Devi mm-hmm. to be mildly interesting. So, Devi is from this opposing tribe of dolphins called Terciops or something like that. I can't remember how to pronounce it. Um, and they're a very warlike dolphin clan, and they actually ousted the Longi years and years ago from their homeland. And now they live in the in the ancestral Longi waters. And they're, they're very warlike, they're very patriarchal, and Devi has kind of um, harnessed her power by being the first wife of one of uh, of the main leader of the clan and and exercising her power and control over this harem, what they call a harem of dolphin wives. And she was interesting just because she was evil, <laughs> I thought, and she was also kind of fiercely protective of her young son, who was not developing into the typical warrior um, and who was really spurned by his father. So she was the closest I found to having kind of a complex, interesting character to pick apart. Yeah, I liked her, actually. Yeah. She was, I also... I felt bad for her at times. Yeah, yeah. It was interesting because the way that she deals with her, I don't know, mate, I suppose, the the, the male dolphin who's the head of the, the alpha dolphin, I guess. Um, the way that she kind of deals with him and deals with the rest of the harem, and deals with their son. I was kind of wondering in, in places if it was almost too complex. Like, maybe this is just my neuroscientist critical side coming out, but mm-hmm. I was like, these are very complex relationships. Um, it was very interesting, and I, I liked it, but um, I don't know. I, I kept kind of getting a little bit stuck with this. I, I still really like the book. I, I didn't, I didn't um, dislike mm-hmm. it as much as you did, but I was continually getting um, a bit stuck on... Is this supposed to be exactly how dolphins are? Like, because, yeah, like I've studied neuroscience and like animal neuroscience quite a lot. So I was sort of, yeah, getting my neuroscience brain on thinking like, is this what we know about complex dolphin relationship? It's a, it's a really weird book to critique. I just really liked it, though, because I found it interesting. It was different. I've never read about like dolphins explicitly. I And I just liked it for that reason, honestly. It was like unique. Mm-hmm. And I get so freaking bored with books on the women's prize long list sometimes. Oh yeah, I agree. It was a it was a unique concept. It was it was what drew me because you and I both agreed that this was the book on the long list. Yeah. Like the second I heard like, oh, it's about a dolphin, I was like, you know, all the care. I was like, oh, th- this is this is going to be read by me instantly. So, <laughs> I guess my I guess maybe also I'm extra disappointed because I thought I would really like this book and uh, I truly truly did not. Yeah, yeah. I just think I th- I think it's just more interesting and 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 ambitious. I guess as a novel. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Going going back to the Devi thing, I actually thought maybe I thought she was super more interesting than the rest because I had just DNF'd Glory by Noviola Bulawayo. And there's a character in Glory who has a very similar circumstance going on, who is the main horse's wife. Do you know what I'm talking about? Um, I do remember. I mean, to be honest, I feel like there's a lot of characters like Devi in fiction. Well, she kind of mainly, but I guess because she's also like an animal yeah. um, and, and it's the, all these humanized animal creatures, she has also kind of attracted power to herself through her um, kind of relationship with the man um, that is, that is kind of the man in charge. And she's a very divisive character for the rest of the animals in the book because many people feel like um, even though they agree with what she's saying, she's overstepping her boundaries as a woman. And she also uses her position as this lead woman to put down and criticize and persecute other um, women. Um, and mm-hmm. Debbie often does the exact same thing. Yeah, exactly. She reminded me a lot of a character. I'm just going to have to look at my story graph. A book that I read last year. Can you remember it? It was about... the. It was from a guy who had multiple wives, and it was the perspective of the second wife, the youngest wife. Do you know what I'm talking about? Was it... What, what was it? Terry this? Jones? I don't think so. Okay. That's the only book I can think of but that has features a guy with more than one wife. And the second wife... There's, there's two and... There's like second and third wives... 
and he's impotent i think they're trying to have a child and there's like one child who's older who's like nine years old what is this book Ah, oh, here we go the secret lives of baba sage's wives by lola shanine yes here we go okay i read it for a book club in um i gave it two stars okay um okay sorry that actually was not worth <laughs> that a painful diversion but the secret lives of baba sage's wives in that book that's about um it's set in nigeria and it's about a family that has just is polyamorous um sort of controversially um and the point is the first wife and devi are very similar characters that's literally all the point i was trying to make okay <laughs> <She reminded me laughs> <of that>. so <laughs> write that down please um yeah so i that was the closest i found to being compelled by any of the dolphins um there, like, also a huge deal is made in this book of like the dance of the spiral dolphins mm-hmm. and how these spiral dolphins spin and do all these little tricks and it's supposed to be like kind of spiritual because they can hear the patterns in the water that drive them to do the spins and tricks and stuff that they do and i um could not have cared less um like (laughs) but a huge deal is made of it i mean don't like it is constant on the page about like how glorious this is and how important it is and all this different stuff um there's just a lot of stuff in the book that i feel like is really imbued with the sense of like being super important and profound and beautiful that i did not find to be those things okay um yeah i quite like those parts i guess i just am more into dolphins than you are Mm. Maybe. Makes sense. Maybe. Um, Although, what, I have to say, I looked up, like, spinner dolphins, and I was like, oh, it is beautiful. Like, I was moved by that that beauty. <laughs> um, I did find there's a lot of rape in this, which I was... Jesus. Yeah, which I was like... God. I got very tired of, and I thought... I thought this element of the book didn't really work, to be honest, because I thought that she was trying to... The way that she's translating essentially human... I don't want to sort of like, um, I mean, I don't want to be too glib about what I'm trying to say, but the way that you're sort of translating human um, structures and human ideas, I would say, like human morals onto dolphins, Mm -hmm. I think this really didn't work. And I don't think it was the best because as I was reading it, it's obviously, she's obviously writing a lot about um, patriarchy, male dominance. All this kind yes. of stuff. But I was having quite a lot of trouble actually understanding what she was trying to say because she's Same. it's all covered up in this dolphin world. Um, and I don't know if she was even trying to say anything because then when I read her story notes, I was like, oh, <laughs> there's nothing in here about like sex or hierarchies or like <laughs> power or control or anything like that. Um, so it's all kind of in there. And it felt like she was trying to make a point. The point I found quite hard to get through to because it's so covered up in like dolphin politics. And I was like, "Yes, are we talking about dolphin colonies? <laughs> it was weird. Um, yeah, it was so- very weird. It was very weird how like, like a ton of rape happens to the main character. Like just a ton. It's bizarre to me how little of it seems to have that much of an impact on her long term. Like, yeah. It's- bad you know it's bad but it just seems to kind of like i don't know i don't know how to describe it it's just very like and off we go it's yeah it's More quite rape. odd because if she'd done like a human the way that a human would respond that also would have been weird i found that whole the whole part of yes. that i think that should have been cut i didn't think it was that successful and i think because of I the mean, nature of the content I think an editor should have actually been a bit more discerning about this. It was one of those, like, I am not against rape and fiction at all. Um, it was just one of those things where I was like, what is the point of mm-hmm. this? And I wasn't even getting upset by at the rape scenes because I was sensitive to rape. Because to be honest, and this is going to sound terrible when I say this out loud, when you read them, it doesn't feel like a rape scene. Well, it's n- not in the same, like... It's really weird thing to put. Like it, these are animals. It's very strange. Yeah, like the yes. animal kingdom is not the same and as the, the human world. Yes, but it is rape. Like, don't get me wrong, yeah. it is. Um, so it wasn't even like, oh my gosh, this is triggering and upsetting me, or like, the, uh, do we need all this upsetting content or anything like that? It was just like, how many more scenes are we going? Like, 
the point has been made. You know what I yeah. mean? Like, like this is an incredible amount of rape. Yeah, so much dolphin penis as well. Like, a lot of description. So I was like, good much. lord. <laughs> Not again. <laughs> so much. Yeah, it is an overwhelming amount of, of that. Yeah, it just was was not a book for me. But obviously people have found qualities they like about it. Yeah, I think it's because it's Yeah. Yeah, I don't yeah, interesting. I'm I'll be very interested actually. I assume it probably won't get shortlisted. I'd be surprised if it got shortlisted. Um, I would be but sad. I would have been inter- I would have been um, interested to see what the judges say. I guess I can look at the long list and see what they say. Um, I'm, I'll be interested to say to see what they th- what they say the book is about. Well, I was going to say I read Guardian reviews and stuff like that, and it all praised it. Mm. Uh, I am the only person really taking a gigantic dump on this book. Yeah, interesting. Um, and they praise it for like the environmental perspective, I suppose. They more just called it like a grand sea adventure and stuff like that okay. and how it you felt for all these dolphins Blech. okay interesting um there are elements of it that are about human the hu- effect of hum- humans on the sea i suppose yes and um, what did you think of those parts i thought those were interesting i liked the bit like for example something that kind of happens in the book is that like Google is obviously the dolphin that I think has been the most affected by humans and their relationship to the environment because basically an explosion happens that kind of has consequences for that area of the water. Um, So that was really interesting. It was also interesting to see like how different um, animals had different reactions to ships because, for example, there's a whale whose entire like community was killed off by a ship. And so he hates ships and he's singing this like song of lament about the ship and what it's done to him. But then there's also the Terciops who um, get their food by the ships like releasing. I never, I was never quite sure exactly how this happened, but basically a whole bunch of dead fish. Um, and they were like eating on, on these dead fish and they called, um, this they called them the god aboves um so basically different animals and stuff like have different relationships to what the humans are doing to the water um but you know it was interesting to me because i did not think that that was really the main point of the book at all so it was interesting to me that like she felt that that was like her main message Mm. yeah it was quite a small i think it yeah it was quite a small part of the book um that part's relatively subtle (laughs) compared to the other stuff yeah um which is also why i was confused (laughs) um by by that i think definitely the best the uh, definitely the best most successful part i think was actually the bit that was more directly dealing with human and dolphin um relationships i guess um google yeah google so i think even it would have been better if she just more more sort of stuck actually with his story um on his own and maybe just focused on him trying to integrate into a real life dolphin pod i think that would have been much much more successful there's a young adult novel that does something kind of similar uh to what this book is trying to do which was um written by patrick ness and it's um a picture book so it has like these beautiful illustrations in it by ravina kai and it's called and the ocean was our sky do you remember when this book came out no I don't, I've never heard of it, actually. Um, so I read it, and it's an inverted tale of Moby Dick. So you're following the perspective of the whales mm-hmm. um, in Moby Dick. And the ocean was our sky because the ocean is the sky for the whales, blah, 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 right? I thought that book was more successful in describing these kinds of relationships. Um, one, because it's way, way shorter, so you're not like having to slog through all this repetitive stuff. And two, because it really kind of... Uh, lingers in the weirdness of these animals and the strangeness and the kind of inunderstandability of of them in a way that's also meant for young adults so it's really accessible so i i would i don't know i feel like if you're wanting a book about whales and dolphins and oceans and all that different stuff and their cultures um with kind of almost fantastical twist on it i would almost shocking coming from me i would recommend this ya novel over this I think I think that's about it, mate. Um, so I so what's the summary? I Is liked it? it quite a lot. I liked it more for what it was. Yeah. I liked it more for how to phrase. I appreciated it more for what the thing that I was reading, if you know what I mean. I liked reading something different. Yeah. Um, 
I've been reading a lot of like annoying historical fiction because <laughs> I think so. For more for context, originally <laughs> we were going to read *The Night Shift* by Jess Kidd, *The Night Shift* by Jess Kidd, mm-hmm. which is kind of funny because I bailed. I probably felt the same way that you did about this book, but I took com- mm-hmm. control of the episode and I was like, "We're not doing this. I can't. I cannot <laughs> discuss this book with you." Funnily enough, and then I also had just read um, *The Marriage Portrait* by Maggie O'Farrell, so. Contextually, I was just delighted mm. to be reading something that wasn't, what to my eyes, an irritating historical fiction. Um, yes. So I just, I yeah, I just honestly found it refreshing to read something that was kind of like weird and and challenging on the women's prize long list. Yeah. Um, which is not. I get that. Yeah. So I was, uh, I was ready for it. I was excited for the ideas. I agree completely with that. Um, just was not my cup of tea in terms of its execution. I but... think it wasn't entirely successful, but. Um... I still enjoyed it. Well, thank you very much for listening. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. If you want to contact us with any questions, ideas, feedback, or recommendations, you can email us at thebookcastclub at outlook.com. We are on Twitter and Instagram at bookcastclub. Uh, You can also leave us a voice message that we can play on the podcast. The link for that is in the show notes. And you can sign up to our newsletter where we have more reviews, new releases, podcast recommendations, and updates on the pod. And we are also on Patreon if you would like to support us over there. We would greatly appreciate it. Thank you very much for listening, and we will see you again soon. Bye. Bye.